This is AI Studio, where top-notch experts analyze the latest trends of artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Leventa. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to AI Studio, the artificial intelligence podcast by the Hungarian AI Coalition. This is season three, episode six, and it's our reinforcement special edition. Ladies and gentlemen, as we dedicate this show to the upcoming Reinforce conference, a fantastic event featuring renowned AI experts from all over the world. Reinforce normally takes place in a brick and mortar venue in Budapest, Hungary. But this time, because of the pandemic, it will be held virtually from March 3rd to March 5th. For more details, please visit reinforce.com. And that's where you find the awesome speaker lineup as well. And among those speakers is also today's guest on the show, who I would like to warmly welcome. On the line here with us is Chaba Sepeshwari, research scientist of DeepMind and professor of computing sciences at the University of Alberta, Canada. We're thrilled to have you on the show, Chaba. Thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, actually, fun fact for the audience that the local time zone in Alberta is called Mountain Daylight Time, right? Is that correct? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's correct. <laughs> Which is, I believe, an awesome way to call a time zone. I mean, this is the, the, the most fun way to, to call a time zone. No question about it. And we've got a time difference of eight hours, right? Yeah. Uh, fun fact, too, that like uh, this is a big country here. And we are 300 kilometers away from the mountains. I wish we were a little bit closer. <laughs> but in terms of like local culture, this is just considered mountains. <laughs> okay. Good to this know because okay. I, I really, I, I was so curious to find out like how, how on earth um, uh, it got to be called mountain daylight time. But now we know that, uh, yeah, the mountains are actually not that close. Um, and speaking of the mountains, uh, just one more small thing, because I, I checked uh, where you're based exactly, and my Google search gave me, like, amazing photos, Trouble. I mean, they're like, it's just so beautiful out there. Do you get inspired by this natural beauty in your work? Oh, yeah. I really want to yeah. Test. yeah? It, it is It is really incredible. Uh, so, for example, where I live, uh, this this town, Edmonton, uh, it is uh, really beautiful. It, it, you don't feel like that you're far away from nature. Uh, it's a relatively big town, like one million people about. Uh, but in every neighborhood, there's a little creek. You can walk there, and then you, you feel that you're part of nature. It's really beautiful. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, you need inspiration for sure, because you've been working on amazing stuff. Uh, at DeepMind and at the University of Alberta. And as we all know, uh, DeepMind is well known for um, its uh, game-related innovations, right? And uh, probably most importantly, uh, it, it developed AlphaGo uh, that beat the best Go player at the time in 2016. And uh, very few people know that you were the co-inventor uh, of this algorithm behind AlphaGo. Is that right? Well, some small part of it, I would say. <laughs> so there is there is one ingredient in it uh, that was invented like 10 years before. And that was together with another Hungarian colleague, uh, Levante Kocsis. Actually, I would say that he is kind of the main brains uh, behind an idea. So that's Monte Carlo tree search in a specific instance of it. And uh, AlphaGo indeed uh, used Monte Carlo tree search, uh, some variation of the algorithm that we designed. Right. Well, just to uh, give a little bit of background to our audience, I mean, uh, not many people are familiar with Go, right? And uh, I just checked, uh, I just looked it up that uh, it's like it's been around for over 3,000 years or something. And uh, there are even private Go schools in Korea. I mean, I. <laughs> I'm just yeah. fascinated. But did you did you did you have anything to do with Go before this whole project at all? Not not that much. Like I, I played a little when I was a kid, and I realized that it was a fun game. Uh, oh, you did? But yeah, no, no, not seriously. It's just for fun uh, with friends, you know. And uh, in 2006, when uh, we worked on this algorithm with with Levante, and he came back from a computer games conference and at the time 
Uh, people are really excited about this idea of just running these rollouts, massive computation, and, and it seems that it's doing something that was unimaginable before. Uh, so they were getting pretty strong results with pretty simple ideas. And so, so we got excited about that. And that was in the context of Go, actually. So already at the time, like there was quite a bit of excitement about uh, the game of Go. And, you know, uh, you mentioned that DeepMind's known for um, breakthroughs in games. And mm -hmm. it might seem that DeepMind's really focusing on games. I wouldn't really say that. I think that DeepMind's focusing on benchmarks where you can demonstrate uh, advances in a very clear fashion so that like everyone understands that, hey, like there is something going on here. Right. And then for that game seems to be, they have always been, uh, you know, great for these kind of demonstrations of advances. So it's a coincidence, but but it's it's great. Like it's, it's also a lot of fun to work in this game. Yeah, I can imagine. But uh, well, uh, anyway, uh, it, it delivers the message, right? That uh, people just, you know, uh, notice that there's something going on and uh, you know there's another benchmark another benchmark and and, and somehow uh, for some reason it's it's connected with deepmind and then you know when uh, since deepmind is also involved in many other things uh, they they have this really really um cool idea about deepmind and they associate it with like really state of the art stuff and i i think that that's what matters and just one one i, I would like to uh, give one quote uh, that i found just to just to uh show the audience uh, how like what is go like it's 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 by a, a gentleman called edward lasker and i'm sorry I, I i never heard of the guy but apparently he's a very very well-known chess and go player from the 20th century uh so prehistoric times right and and goes like this why, while the Baroque rules of chess could only have been created by humans, the rules of Go are so elegant, organic, and rigorously logical that if intelligent life forms exist elsewhere in the universe, they almost certainly play Go. So <laughs> this guy says that uh, aliens also play Go in their free time, right? So <laughs> it's got to be really, really uh, special. And that's why uh, I would like to really know why it was such a, a big deal back then that uh, AlphaGo beat uh, uh, the world champion? Yeah, it, it's a big deal for, for many reasons. Uh, so one of the reasons is that uh, the game of Go was withstanding uh, all the attacks that uh, researchers made at it of making computers better at it. Uh, so, you know, like uh, chess fell quite early on. Um, and you didn't need, like you needed some level of sophistication for the techniques uh, to work at chess, uh, but the same techniques didn't seem to uh, give any way uh, in the game of Go for a long, long time. Uh, research was stuck at the level where a, uh, a human player who is training for maybe a year or two can still beat computer games like the best computer programs. And that right. was like the state of the art for many, many decades. And so, so the big deal is that um, this was considered a serious uh, issue that like we have no idea of how to overcome the limitations of these programs. And so DeepMind brought a bunch of techniques to the table uh, that have been used before, but no one really had the vision uh, and maybe the capacity, but I think it's, it's mostly lacking, lacking vision and determination to drive this through um, that, that these techniques are going to uh, lead to uh, such a big, big breakthrough. And uh, no one actually expected this because of this history of uh, Go. Like people were really skeptical. And DeepMind first started to uh, play publicly human players. Everyone in the field was like, yeah, okay, it can go. <laughs> it may not go that well for DeepMind. <laughs> and then eventually they play the best play in the world and they win like in a decisive way. Wow, that was really amazing. Like. Yeah, well, the guy who lost, I mean, he was pretty displeased. <laughs> I, I read a lot about that. But were you actually there uh, when it happened, no, no, when, it, when it went down? I, actually, no? actually, I was not uh, part of DeepMind at the time. I, I was in Alberta, 
And, mm-hmm. and I have to say that, you know, Alberta, that is a very strong games group. You, you may know it, know it. And a bunch of folks who work in DeepMind are originally from here. And uh, so in Alberta, we were watching online, of course, with this game group. And like, we were cheering for the computer or the humans. And like, <laughs> I don't know, like it was, it was one kind of a moment. You know, big projector, and then like, yeah. <laughs> wasn't it weird to root for the the, the machines in this uh, ultimate human versus machine duel? I'm not sure whether we were rooting for the machines. So, like, uh, yeah, it's uh, I can't speak uh, definitely for everyone. For me, it was just like really interesting to uh, to see whether uh, the machine is really on par of of humans now. Uh, after these advances. And uh, I guess maybe I'm a little bit of an outsider as well uh, from the perspective of the game. And and I always wanted to participate in uh, creating programs that are smarter than me. For some reason, like, I don't know, like, I'm just a lazy person, I guess. And I don't want to think that hard. And I imagine that like the easiest way to, I don't know, win at something is to create this computer programs that win for you. <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> the cheater instinct or I don't know what is it, but I, I was always inspired by the thought that like you can buy a computer program that outsmarts you. And okay, I'm not. That smart, right? Like, and then it outsmarts uh, the best human player in the world. I mean, like, that's that is something. <laughs> right. So I, I believe you wouldn't mind having uh, an avatar that you that that could replace you, like in a meeting or something. You don't have time time for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's the next project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please let us know if you're. <laughs> <laughs> if you're advancing well enough and because many of us would be very much interested okay we can <laughs> open source it <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect now let's talk about a uh, little bit um, about uh, uh, the deep blue thing because as you mentioned uh, chess fell early on but it was back in 97 when deep blue beat Kasp- uh, kasparov right uh, but that was a long time ago and um, people might want to understand uh what the difference is between between that achievement and AlphaGo's achievement, or what's what, 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 why, why is it so different? So before talking about the differences, I think that there are lots of similarities as well, right? Like people didn't expect the computers to win. <laughs> Feelings of people were, I think, very similar. The feeling of Kasparov, if you, if you watch back the interviews, he like, was furious. He was devastated. Yeah, yeah he exactly. was like. <laughs> This shouldn't happen. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so in a, in many ways it was similar, and that should teach us the lesson about uh, our humble uh, capabilities <laughs> when it comes to competing <laughs> with other things, other beings or computers or whatnot. So that's that's a similarity. Some this so the dissimilarities is that the techniques used in these programs are different. So I, as I uh, said before, the techniques that were used uh, in Deep Blue and later on perfected and like led to much, much stronger plays, uh, much, much stronger computer programs, like today's chess programs. Uh, not sure whether you know, like they're so much better than humans. Like it's unbelievably better. Like there is absolutely no question. Like your your phone can beat you. Like it's, it's unbelievable. And the programs are not that crazy big and they don't do that much computation. But anyway, so there are the techniques and those techniques didn't uh, give away in Go. And uh, so there are two innovations at least in the computer, like in in, uh, AlphaGo uh, or three, depending on how you count it. So one is to use learning techniques to actually learn to play a game. And people have been experimenting with learning techniques from the 50s, like the very early on attempts to build computer programs were based on these ideas. Uh, but this was the first, well, no, maybe uh, not, not really the first time. We shouldn't forget about like early similar achievements like Backgammon also found quite early. And that was a learning program that was using very similar principles. It was in the 90s. And that program was also playing 
uh, at the level of top human players and humans were saying, wow, okay, like the moves that it makes, like it's, you know, unreal and uh, superhuman in a way, like uh, at the time people didn't use that language, I, I think, but that was the essence. So learning was one key difference to the chess programs. And the other was that the, the nature of the search algorithm was changed to this row loads based Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, which is works quite differently than uh, the search algorithms worked in chess programs. And, but let's just say AlphaGo was still just the start, right? And it was five years ago and it seems like eternity. So, because yeah. well, a, lot of, a lot of things have happened, like Alpha Zero came along, which I just, I read like it trained itself like in four hours uh, against the, the best chess program at the time, right? And it, and it, and it did beat it a couple of times afterwards. Uh, and then uh, you've got this uh, new landmark, the StarCraft thing, uh, which is like uh, basically a real-time strategic game. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, people are wondering, uh, where is this whole thing headed, like, uh, in, the, in terms of games? Like, now uh, AI can, can play real-time strategic games better than humans. Uh, can, it be, can, can it go any, any, any further, any higher up? I'm sure it can. <laughs> or, or the sky's the limit. Or what's, what, what's the limit? Is, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the ultimate question here. Yeah, I think that... Um... Maybe computer games are um, like it's been quite clearly demonstrated now that uh, the techniques um, behind the scene of, of these programs, of these newer programs, generalize quite well across different games um, and they're able to achieve uh, good performance. Uh, so maybe you could say that like the age of humans is over for games. Uh, if you take off a zero and like, you have a board game and whatnot, you just make some small adjustments. It's probably going to be the best player in the world uh, at that board, board game after a couple of hours of self-play. Uh, that's really devastating <laughs> if, if, you, if you want to put it in negative perspective. But at the same time, there is much to learn, right? So people are going to innovate to... Uh, to use programs in new ways, to learn from them. In chess, after it was very clearly demonstrated that computers are much better than humans, uh, people figured that uh, still human computer teams are better than just computers, obviously they're better than just humans. And so there are really interesting uh, questions, um, research questions and like opportunities to uh, exploit cooperation uh, or use this uh, game uh, playing agents to perfect your computer games. Let's not forget that the reason humans play games is mainly for fun, right? Like we also like to compete with each other, but like you have tremendous fun. And so everyone who writes game programs can try to use these new opportunities, these new programs to make the programs even more fun. Like the players have always been complaining about how dumb the AIs are. Who is the time to replace the dumb AIs with a little bit smarter, maybe not all the way to the level of, uh, of a start or of a zero, but uh, you, you can adjust the level and you can make the game really, really fun. I'm so glad you're, you're focusing on the bright side. Of this whole thing uh, <laughs> no no no. but so are we you know in the uh, ai coalition here in hungary i mean that's the whole idea you know to um to make sure people understand that there's actually good coming out of this and uh, i just wanted to mention to you also and to, to the to our audience here that uh, we relaunched this uh, initiative this um, campaign called the ai challenge and under this challenge uh, we'd like to um to get 100,000 people in Hungary to complete uh, an online AI course, which was developed uh, by Hungarian professionals. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's about the, you know, uh, uh, about the concept of AI and the ethical uh, aspects and uh, use cases, all that kind of stuff. So you, we really uh, want to become sort of the AI nation here uh, in the world. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, very ambitious Good here. Luck. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. 100,000 is a pretty big number, right? 
<laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. Good to have it, some it issues. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you also mentioned uh, uh, early on in, in, in the beginning of our, our conversation that um, uh, DeepMind uh, is involved in, in many projects, right? And uh, uh, developing um, games and um, uh, game savvy programs is only part of the uh, part of the equation, right? <laughs> Uh, so what, what are the real life, uh, benefits of all these, uh, AI developments, uh, at DeepMind, if, if you want to talk about that briefly. Well, uh, when, when we're talking about real life impact, then we can, um, talk about direct and indirect impact. And I think DeepMind is doing a lot of foundational research and, uh, with that, for example, developing these programs to play games. I think that the largest impact is by making the publications available and open, and sometimes even the code open so that other people can follow up and uh, replicate the successes and translate them to other domains. I know, for example, about companies who are trying to use off a zero type of uh, algorithms and techniques for Operation, operations research problems, you know, scheduling problems, whatnot. So people got a whole set of new tools and new ideas to work on problems that they always wanted to get better at. And a lot of people are inspired. And I think that that's, that's the biggest impact uh, at the moment. And that's, I, I think that it's really hard to measure it, but I feel that we really do have a, a, a huge impact uh, in that regard. Uh, so concerning direct impact, uh, DeepMind is not really in the application space. Of course, uh, we work very closely with Google. So uh, there are some applications within Google uh, that uh, use uh, DeepMind's uh, technology in, in various ways. Uh, that should be beneficial, hopefully, for, for everyone and Google, uh, obviously. Also, you might have heard about uh, DeepMind's initiative uh, working on protein folding. Oh, yeah, definitely, uh, yeah. So that's, that's like a, a big uh, science challenge, and, and DeepMind being heavily uh, invested in that challenge. And uh, just this year, or, uh, sorry, last year, uh, time's flying indeed, uh, there's been... Uh, some announcements about that and understand that, uh, I don't know, uh, benchmarks, uh, there's been some great advancement coming from uh, using uh, DeepMind's uh, new innovations uh, in this field. And if you think about the use cases for protein folding, they're really great, right? Like uh, all kind of medical applications, uh, how to uh, design medications and whatnot uh, with computers and uh, with the virus going on, we know that this has uh, like similar things have already been uh, put in good use, right? Uh, right? With the design of the vaccine. So so we see that uh, these things are not necessarily in the realm of sci-fi anymore. Not at all. Uh, that you could just use computers to design better drugs, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's fascinating indeed, and 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 we're so happy to to hear such news, and uh, really looking really looking forward to all your efforts at, at DeepMind uh, in all kinds of areas. Because I also read that um, now you have something uh, like an invention that basically can detect uh, eye disease, uh, just like the, the best doctors can. And, uh, and, you know, uh, things like that just really fascinate me. And I think yeah. all of us, uh, I think we're inching closer to the end of the show here. So, uh, I guess just, there's just one question remaining. We, uh, I wanted to discuss with you and that is like, you know, the, like the big picture, we really, really want to know what you think about the future, um, the future of AI and how AI is going to impact the world as such. Uh, we've talked about the, um, the, uh, potential, um, uh, outlook, uh, how AI is going to uh, uh, influence and impact uh, the, the game industry and the pro uh, perspective of games. But uh, what is it going to look like, you know, in, in, in the real world? Is everybody going to live 
happily ever after in an in a brave new AI world or something? Or do you have do you have other other another vision? Predictions are are difficult, especially when they concern the future. <laughs> <laughs> And I think people have been proven wrong uh, with the predictions way too many times, but if, especially when it comes to AI. So progress uh, seems to be uh, hard to predict. Sometimes it surprises us. Uh, sometimes we are a little bit disappointed that things still don't work. But I'm, I'm at heart an optimist uh, about the use of technology. And, and I think that humanity's uh, state of affairs have greatly improved by the use of technologies in ways that been even unimaginable. But of course, uh, with great powers come uh, with great responsibilities. Uh, so the more use a technology has, uh, the more conscious you have to be about the potential harm that it can also do. Uh, I think that people are out aware of this these days. So I, I remain to be optimistic. Uh, and I think that we're gonna get it right. And uh, we're gonna get uh, achievements and, uh, and ways of living that uh, have been unimaginable before. Awesome. Well, we, we couldn't agree with you more, I guess, on those predictions. And I was gonna say, whatever you say uh, in terms of predictions, we, we won't... Uh, hold you accountable for them <laughs> but, but since <laughs> there was all optimistic stuff um we really really, really uh, uh can't wait for all this uh, to happen and uh, b- before we wrap it up i, I really wanted uh, you to um to share um like a teaser of your of your talk at reinforce conference just to uh give a taste uh to, to the audience of what, what you're going to talk about you know so they, they have something to look forward to that puts me into an interesting spot because i've been going back and forth between different ideas about what exactly to talk about <laughs> uh, so definitely i'm going to talk about my my research and why i do what i do and uh how i think uh what I do can be important even for people who are not doing exactly the same things, which is theory, right? So I, I work on theoretical aspects of uh, reinforcement learning, but I think that uh, the, the results that we are aiming for have real uh, and important consequences even for, for people who are not doing theory. And uh, I'm planning to talk about this, like in, in what way uh, should you uh, think about this type of research and, and this type of results and uh, how to make uh, use of it when it comes to, you know, like doing more mundane things like you want to code up your next AI for something. Awesome. Well, we can't wait for, uh, for your talk to... To take place and i really encourage everybody to to tune in uh tickets are still available uh at reinforce.com and uh, Choba, thank you so much for for these awesome insights great food for t- food for thought and great takeaways thank you so much for joining for having joined us today yeah thanks thanks for having me and thank you all for listening and don't forget to check out the website of the hungarian ai ecosystem at ai-hungary.com for the latest on what's happening around AI in Hungary and the CEE region. For starters, take a look at Hungary's AI strategy that draws up an entire roadmap through 2030 in terms of policies, KPIs, and ambitions. So check out Hungary's vision of an AI-enabled future at ai-hungary.com. I also want to thank my colleague, Adam Nutig, who's in charge of the sound and all that jazz. Thank you so much again, and see you in the next episode. You listen to AI Studio, a podcast by the Hungarian Artificial Intelligence Coalition, which is the ultimate stakeholder forum of the local AI ecosystem. If you have any comments, ping us via our social media channels, and please help spread the word by sharing our content. Don't forget to subscribe and rate the show. And thanks a lot for listening. We'll be back in our next episode with more great insights on AI. Thank you.